Thanks, Adrian. I'm not actually talking about that. Sorry, Adrian. I did, <laughs> I did say I wasn't to them, but obviously I didn't. But um, that's all right. And I think I sort of changed it a couple of days ago and thought maybe we'll talk about small fish again instead of something that's still in the basin and still in South Australia, some species instead of things that are long gone. But And we've got to keep deflation, def, deflation basins open for threatened fish as well. It's one big thing. But first, I will talk about the keystone species I mentioned briefly, because um, I know a lot of you are here probably to hear about it. That's probably why you came. But um, this guy here, not Mike Geddes, the other guy, Murray Crayfish. Um, I, yeah, we've done a lot of work on them interstate and, and in South Australia, um, which might sound funny because it's not here. But um, they once were really common in South Australia along the Murray. Um, some of the floodplain tributaries as well. Um, they haven't been recorded for 30 years. Um, and we've done some sampling in the last four years looking for them. They're not here, so <laughs> it's a lot of empty nets being lifted, but you never, you never know. So um, yeah, they're not here. They haven't been here for a long time. So you may say, what's the point? Why bother? We're having enough trouble managing the species that are still here um, and threatened. So why introduce a new species into the mix and you could be right, but I, um, I am quite convinced and quite passionate about actually getting them back, and I do think there could be a benefit. Um, first of all, there is habitat where they could occur, um, despite the Lower Murray being a big lake now. Um, there are some free-flowing sections that they need. They need that flowing water. Um, and we also know how to get them back. We've done what we're classing as the first translocation of the species in 100 years in the basin last year to a spot round Echuca. Um, so we have the knowledge of, of how to transport them, the genetics, where good populations are. Um, we have all that information, so we're pretty well at this point of, of doing it and having some people interested in, on this far-fetched idea. And there could be benefits, like there could be ecological benefits as a keystone species, sure, but also social benefits um, to communities. A species coming back from the dead, it's a good um, analogy for the river potentially, if we're trying to be optimistic with all of the um, discussion today. Um, so if you've got any questions, come and see me, but it might happen one day. You might see it in the paper one day and it's happened, so that would be good. Um, but more pressing issues, the little guys, the small bodied fish. So you hear about cod and you hear about little cod, which are about the same size, if not a little bit smaller than the little guys, but there are a lot of small-bodied fish, and actually most of the species, or half of the species, I should say, in the basin are actually considered small-bodied, short-lived, only grow to about 15 centimetres. Um, the SA Murray-Darling region, so that includes the Murray, those floodplain wetlands, the lower lakes, the Coorong, but also the eastern Mount Lofty tributaries, um, diverse range of, historically, of habitats, and also connectivity with the ocean through to the, the tributary streams and up the Murray um, and into the wetlands are really important. 80% of those small-bodied species occur around the, in this SA Murray-Darling Basin region. So it is, it is really important that they're, they're looked after and considered. Um, typically, they haven't been um, in, a, in a lot of, lot of things. They sort of are neglected. They're small and, and insignificant. We won't worry about them. We'll worry about recreationally fish species, which um, has its place, but also I think there needs to be a bit more of attention placed on these small-bodied guys. And not surprisingly, they're at, they're at risk. So half of the small-bodied species are threatened in South Australia. Um, a whole range of impacts, river regulation, um, changes to flow regimes of wetlands, maintaining um, stable water levels too. It's part of that regulation. Um, threatened species, they obviously grow to a size that's pretty tasty little size like that for a lot of predators to eat. Um, there's actually been two small-bodied species already become extinct in the basin. And, uh, sorry, in the, the SA Murray-Darling region. Um, and there's also a number that are now national, oh, internationally and nationally listed. Um, Murray Hardyhead and Yarra Pygmy Perch. And there's a range of others that are critically endangered at a state level. So that's all happened to that point. Obviously, the millennium drought didn't really help things when they were already in a stress system. Fish need water. There's not much water in these photos. So this is 
in the Mount Lofties and around the Lower Lakes, um, Millennium Drought. So this is an event, obviously, that's happened not very often, and the last one maybe a thousand years plus ago. So these individuals haven't experienced these kind of conditions and haven't had the ability to recover. Um, it might take a hundred years. It might take a millennium for them to recover naturally. And that's with the crayfish story. That's a similar thing. You may say, "Oh, they'll recolonise if things were right." The reality is, there's not a not a possibility um, for that to occur naturally in the regulated system we've got now. So they do need some help to get started. Um, so there was a lot of work by a lot of people, um, many in this room, I guess, um, and some have moved on. But essentially, pulling fish out of drying wetlands, establishing captive breeding facilities, surrogate dams, the top one there, um, farm dams, there's enough of them around. So there's generally no shortage of areas to put fish, doing releases, and also recapturing um, reintroduced fish. Um, it's a purple spotted gudgeon. Sylvia's holding there, um, and this species was extinct in South Australia during the drought, um, and it's been able to be put back in. So that's all, all somewhat positive, I guess, that we've got um, that collaborative effort has maintained these species. Without them, if people were asleep at the wheel and didn't put any effort in at that time, we wouldn't have the source of individuals to put back into the wild, um, which is a I think it's worth acknowledging that. Um, we could be banging on now saying, oh, we need to get these fish back, but we don't have the fish to put back. Um, so that's quite an important thing. But to date, the solutions have been relatively small scale. Um, low numbers, I think, to date, through a uh, CLIM-funded project with the Saudi guys, BICI in particular, um, and more recently through NRM-funded projects, we've released about 36,000 fish across four different species. Um, yeah, still seems maybe high if you're counting something, um, but pretty low when you're looking at the scale of the problem and also the scale of the habitats they're going back into. And there has been some um, recovery. It's quite patchy and given the fragmented nature of the populations, it's quite um, fragmented the recovery too. So Murray Hardyhead have come back to an extent around Lake Alexandrina, around some of the fridging habitats and on Highmarsh Island, but Lake Albert, there hasn't been an individual recorded for about 10 years. Um, we have done some reintroductions over the last couple of years to get them back, but they haven't, um, yeah, haven't come back yet. So some species have come back to a, a greater extent, others haven't. Um, and I guess one important thing is we've got some stro strong surrogate refuges, so those farm dams I talked about or captive breeding facilities. But some have collapsed over the eight years or so since they've been established, and it's through changes of ownership they decide to do different things. We've got one that people are farming ducks on now, so you would never have anticipated that eight years ago that they'd try and farm ducks. Still has some fish. Some have completely dried out. It's just the nature. They're short-term or medium-term solutions. Um, we still have some fish available across the species, and as I mentioned, the mismatch between the scale of the problem and the solutions, not necessarily through fault of anyone to date, but I guess it's just become more of a realisation in the last couple of years that if we are going to be serious about re-establishing some of these species, then the effort probably has to scale up or we acknowledge things are going to dry out, the climate's going to change and we don't sort of worry about it in a, in a wild setting, but I think that's a pretty pessimistic um, view to have. So as I said, there's a slowly growing recognition of, of what needs to be done and, and perhaps things are on life support really. Um, of those four, um, little big four species, um, strong populations in the wild are probably, well, some recovery is occurring for two of them. One's found in one location only, the purple spotted gudgeon and Yarra pygma perch is a slightly more concerning story, which I'll summarise briefly. Um, so to this end, there's obviously a whole range of other restoration things occurring which you'll hear about throughout this um, conference and, and you'll know bits about. But um, in terms of what needs to be done with the fish, it's sort of def deciding how many we need and how often and also not just establishing one population in one area. Is it, fe is it actually feasible to establish connected populations that can withstand changes um, over time? Um, 
that may not be a reality. It may not be, we might have to acknowledge that in the wild this isn't going to be feasible and we're going to have to establish surrogate areas as the new wild spots perhaps and manage it a little bit more intensively. Um, but I do still again think there is some timely um, ability or some ability now given it's timely, given those habitat um, large scale restorations that are occurring works on Hymash Island that's going to be coming some of those floodplain wetlands of the Murray um, interventions that's occurring and also the carp herpes virus may open up um, habitat for these small body guys um, to be re-established. So just the summary of... Oh cool, good timing. <laughs> of the Harapigu perch. Um, became regionally extinct during the drought, which is not too surprising. The pretty restricted range around the lower lakes, around uh, Lake Albert, I should say. Um, and they were taken out, surrogate refuges, populations of up to 10,000 fish. Um, and we undertook reintroductions and they re-established. They were rediscovered and persisted for a couple of years. Um, and then they were lost again. Um, and they received a sort of a short reprieve in 2015, but haven't been found in the basin for coming on two and a half, three years now. Um, and at that time, the surrogate populations, the main ones, collapsed. So we have less capacity for these guys. And it could be the first freshwater fish extinct from the basin, which we've been saying a fair bit. And it is something pretty significant that there hasn't to date been a freshwater fish. There's only 46, so it's probably not that big of an achievement. But um, it would be with all the hope and potential restoration that's occurring then it would be a bad thing to occur on our watch. Um, so from a, from a reintroduction, that kind of recovery perspective, it's really will come down to more fish more often. This is an aerial photo of, of the lower lakes. That's Currency Creek. Finnis, it doesn't really matter where it is, but it's a bloody big area and this is only one part of it. So the scale needed to match um, the problem, as I've mentioned numerous times, probably needs to be ramped up um, and also needs to be um, combined with some of those complementary measures that are occurring. One last, okay, how long have I got now? I've got, so this, looking at how people are doing it elsewhere, this is a, a dedicated um, f conservation facility in New Mexico um, for a pretty nondescript looking fish which we have here as well, or well, not that species but we've got nondescript small body fish. Um, state of the art design, recycled water, cost about two million dollars to build this facility, um, recreates or mimics the natural environment, they produce fish and importantly which is something that probably hasn't happened too much, they're actually able to do research on these species, temperature, tolerances of different things, behaviour, habitat use, all these kind of things that that reintroduction ecology isn't really occurring. Um, but importantly, million fish, uh, this and other facilities back to the wild. So maybe that's the scale. And then maybe if not, maybe we just recreate environments like this and manage them on the side of the floodplain. And we do do that to an extent. And this is where the species are occurring and we don't worry about these pesky fish in the wild that we have to sort of manage. Um, hopefully it doesn't get to that stage, but how's the time? Am I Perfect. <laughs>